And out of the, let's say, 20 companies, uh, at least two-thirds of them said that they were going to bring in hemp. Thank you very much for joining us here on What Can A Radio, where we take pride in bringing a dose of reality to your conversations about hemp. We are very happy to say that today's episode is brought to you by CBD Peer. Please stick around to the end of the show to learn how you can get a 15% discount on their world-class American-made CBD products. My name is Aiden Washness. I'm happy to be your host today, and now enjoy the show. Product development and manufacturing is like, I mean, you could grow as many plants as you want, produce as much seed as you want, but if you don't have the processing, manufacturing, and then the product development and sales, you're not going to that's going to be pointless to grow. We don't have any testing here. We don't yeah. have any processing here. Uh, now, um, I don't know if this is appropriate use of this time for me to debate this, but uh, uh, it's a frustration because, uh, for example, if you go not too far uh, into the middle of the state, Oneida, uh, the largest greenhouse in North America is under construction. Well, how, what do you think the size of that greenhouse is? Uh, 100,000 square feet, <laughs> larger. 64 <laughs> acres. Oh, wow. <laughs> 64 acres. And it's a Canadian company. And New yeah. York State and the local community said, we need the jobs here. What do you want, Mr. Canadian Greenhouse yeah. Company? And they're growing tomatoes and berries uh, in there. It's under construction. Uh, uh, right now yeah as opposed to developing a company that's within the state and trying to help them bring the resources in so that it's a new york born state and therefore you can have more chain and also like kind of inspire people to build new york businesses well and the point is is that there are others who have different expertise and more expertise yeah. why aren't we going over to where i mean i tried uh, through empire state development uh, we spent a lot of time and money trying to uh, buy a um, Chinese hemp mill. Yeah. But with the uh, the political situation and the, and the uh, uh, taxes and so on, the uh, it, make, it's, it became impossible. Will that change in three years? Who knows. But yeah. the point is, we, there the there are uh, countries that are comfortable making hemp fabric and hemp, have hemp mill, mills and decorticators and so on. In my mind, it would be, hey guys, we're, we will, let's make it. Pay you to come over here, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. set it up, we'll give you the money and so on. Yep. We do this um, uh, all the time. We do this with every industry, like uh, for example, Tesla working with Panasonic to, to make the battery cells, right? Exactly. Um, uh, so it, it, to me, it's mind boggling that we, uh, want, we sort of are making this a failure before it starts, yeah. you know, that there needs to be a, a smart czar up there who understands the pieces and, and, uh, gets a, f so that's one of my attractions to the vast round table is that maybe that Absolutely. we could take on that responsibility, um, um, but it, it needs to happen. Otherwise, uh, people are going to get bored very quickly because they're not making any money. They're not seeing exactly. any yep. significant happen. The CBD industry may disappear from some of these growers and that yeah. uh, we might be able to offer them a whole nother good marketplace. Yeah, whole other uh, revenue source. The support of having a processing in place. So when yeah. Cornell has the seeds and, and so on uh, in place that uh, will be guaranteed to work, uh, that we, we have the full capability of processing and bringing, take, taking the stuff from the, from the field and actually putting in. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely. Well, the, yeah, the but in a, of... in a high quality way, not in yeah, a, yeah. not trying yeah, to just... copy what was done in 1934, you know, yeah. <laughs> which is basically what we're doing, uh, you know, I oh. think is to, so, um, you know, one of the things that impressed me, unfortunately, about the, the COVID-19 is that when there was a huge sh shortage of the ventilators, word went out, almost every clever university had a, had yep. a, a and high tech company yeah. put, a, put together a team and came out with inexpensive versions uh, just to get uh, hundreds of yeah, thousands of ventilators yeah. out there. And that, that, if we said that 
to the world of um, processing for modern hemp. Uh, yeah. We we be surprised. It'll probably be done pretty quickly here, uh, and we would have some solutions. Right now, uh, New York has zero. <laughs> so yeah. you know it can't. It it can say on paper it's a leader, but that's sl slowly disappearing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, getting bringing in companies from outside, bringing in expertise from outside, so that we can start things going. Because while uh, we definitely do need startups, and startups are always good in the new industry, right? You want a company that's kind of lean and can can move around and maneuver uh, different um, issues within the landscape. But you definitely also want to bring in a company that already has a supply chain, already has revenue moving, already has a marketing base, already has uh, all these things set up and say, okay, instead of making this 100% hemp, let's start with like 5% hemp material going into your supply chain and then go from there, right? And then we can expand it. And so it's Well, uh, you know, there, um, just this last week, a German company uh, that's been working on a, a small farm uh Harvester for hemp uh, has finalized and made three, three or four of these uh, handmade units, and he's looking for an agent in New York, in the in the country, U.S. Uh, to uh, produce them. represent and to sell them here for for yeah. you know small size farmer. Um, so there there are products out there. When we spoke with uh, one yeah. of the farm companies uh, here in New York State. They said, yeah, we, we have um, hemp equipment, but it's only sold in Holland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's only sold across this big old ocean. <laughs> you got to ship it across. <laughs> so, but that, yeah, that, that's totally, uh, you know, I understand from them that, that, that they yeah. now are, are looking at the United States as a real market and then are uh, thinking about bringing the uh, U.S. Uh, from their models that they have in Europe uh, to the here, but that's yeah, the kind of uh, we need that kind of. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every single time we want to do a project. No, uh, and uh, some of those things exist and are functioning for the last sixty years fine. Uh, and um, you know, uh, so uh, I was just, um, you know, as as you know, we've been working with a team at RPI regarding um, fashion fiber uh, from an industrial engineering point of view uh, um, against cotton in terms of costs and environmental impacts and so on. Uh, in any case, I've been in touch, uh, I still am in touch with, the, with that team, but also the, um, the denim industry, which is international uh, industry, just had their uh, meeting and they have agreed as a team of, a, you know, of, let's say 20 of the world's mm -hmm. top jeans, Producers, denim manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, a, they were going to skip their full fashion cycle, which they have never done before because wow. of COVID. <laughs> and they were going to focus on spring 21. And out of the, let's say, 20 companies, uh, at least two thirds of them said that they were going to bring in hemp as a sustainable uh, uh, yeah. fiber uh, mixed with cotton and mixed with other things and so on. It's still not 100% because most people like the softness of cotton. And uh, so uh, even Patagonia and the Levi's mix it with cotton and call cottonized hemp. Um, uh, but the point is, is that a year ago, you wouldn't have found the word hemp, except for Patagonia and Levi's. Yeah. Now it's uh, the average uh, uh, gene company is talking industry. about incorporating hemp as an attractive, sustainable, yeah. and also because of its antibacterial qualities and... Uh, Just the strength of it too. It's very durable material that will hold up over a lifetime of use. They figure people are thinking about being more kind of uh, comfy in their homes, yep. working, and uh, it's not just a three-month project, but it could be yep. a three-year or more project. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Project. So, um, 
Uh, yeah, so we, we, we have, uh, besides the things I've mentioned, uh, the ag tech side, we, uh, as you are aware, we've been working with the University of Rochester. Yeah, very cool, very cool technologies. <laughs> THC reader, so a farmer doesn't have to send uh, it out to uh, a lab which doesn't exist in New York State uh, and can get an accurate reading in the field. Um, and um, so we're hoping, um, and also it could, it could uh, identify uh, heavy metals and other types yep. of things uh, in the farmer's yep. crops. And even apply to, to not, not the non-hemp world too, it can be applied to uh, the um, drug officer use or whatever. Instead of, instead of getting a sample of the drug, sending out to a lab, waiting days to weeks to get a sample back for a court order or whatever, they can just test it right on the spot. And so that's A, better safety, B. Yet, um, so in, uh, in Arizona last year, about a third of the crop was destroyed because it was high THC. Yeah. And part of the problem there is they may get seeds from Colorado, but because of the more UV rays in, in Arizona, yeah. that, that possibly affects until they perfect the right seed for the for that climate environment. Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, pain for a handful of uh, farmers who expected to have a profitable crop. So, the, so the, A, the handheld, even if they have, do have to send something to a lab, uh, that at least it gives a peace of mind yeah, to the grower confidence. of what he's got yeah. uh, or give uh, when they should be harvesting it. As Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Have, have, have real-time monitoring so you, you, you know when you can cut the flower off the plant and actually send it in. And also know that when you send it in, you're pretty good chance of getting it back pot like correct so that you can go ahead with harvesting and go ahead with all the other processes instead of wasting resources and money to, to try to do that when they might have gone hot already. And the, the other uh, ag tech um, product that we've been working on is one of our partners, as you know, uh, has um, received a NASA award for making to make the first new telescope in the yeah pretty crazy technology <laughs> like it's it's all all these all these things have been just been getting large basically all the telescopes up to this point have just been uh, taking the same technology and trying to retrofit it into a larger and larger scape but it's it, it becomes unbearable after that. well it works fine on top of a yeah a mountain in, in Hawaii but if you want to do what NASA wants to do which is to take a look at uh, extraterrestrial uh, stars, uh, you have to begin to get closer. Uh, and so um, this, this uh, telescope can be shot up in a, a simple uh, rocket um, and, is, uh, and uses uh, spectrometry as opposed to a lens technology. And um, in any case, uh, NASA uh, and the uh, inventor are interested in looking up to the stars, and I've convinced them to give us the rights to look down on the hemp field. And so uh, putting one of these in the belly of a small drone will be able to capture 100 times more information than conventional drones Current cameras, in yeah. agricultural field. Um, uh, and at a, a half the cost, so yeah. 100 times more information, half the cost, and <laughs> we're and, and far far lighter weight than having to try to fit a camera in. And I mean, many many camera drones out there that are specifically built for agricultural use have an array of multiple different sensors on the bottom, multiple different cameras, different lenses, so they can try to capture all the different spectral information. But this allows us to just have one fairly simple the actual like piece of hardware is pretty simple the the software that goes into processing is a little bit compli complicated but it's pretty simple and it's pretty lightweight so that allows us to have uh, many many different uses yeah well it has applications to forestry and to geology and the military and many others so um so th that's kind of a a um, broad brush uh, description of uh, the different projects that we're working on. Uh, some uh, will happen hopefully uh, one or two, two or three I'm hoping in this year uh, begin and then the others uh, will follow. Um, it's not the easiest time to have people focus on these things when they're 
suffering Based on their health <laughs> yeah other lots of other things going on in the world um but uh you know hemp does have a place now the fact i was really impressed that uh because the gene the denim companies could have reverted back to yeah using cotton they could they could have just take, taken the excuse as many companies have of the COVID situation and, and dialed back on the projects that they were doing like many car companies not doing electric now programs. all of a sudden they they know how to spell the word hemp and are incorporating <laughs> yeah. it in their uh, documents and are being serious about it uh, is really Absolutely. an interesting thing because that means that the U.S. has a chance of justifying uh, getting into the fiber part Absolutely. and I think yeah. that if you speak to a lot of clever farm people, business people, they will say that it's in the, the future is in the fiber. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, the CBD is making a run now, uh, and, uh, but in the, and it will because it's, uh, and, I, and I hope it does because we have yeah. something riding on it too. Our own projects. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, yeah. So anyway, we, uh, anyone who, who's hearing this, who has some interest in learning more or having a meeting, uh, be delighted to uh, follow up with Talk you. Yeah, as I said in the beginning, by far, uh, wanting to work with uh, you in particular and, and Beer Hemp, uh, because we are focused on so many different biomaterials. Um, and as you said, fiber is the future. It's going to take a little bit more time to kind of dial all that up and get it, get it up to scale and get it operating. But uh, for the farmer, a it's, it's I mean for vast majority of farmers in New York State, unless you get into like the southern tier, pretty much everybody is a row crop farmer, and so they have the equipment to actually grow this material. I mean they could just plant with a grain drill, use a sickle bar to cut it up, use a tether to to turn it over when it's ready, and then a round bale to bale it up, right? So that pretty much everybody has uh, if they're in the haying industry or if they're in corn or whatever, they probably have either their own equipment or access to that equipment, right? So that for the farmer, that's a lot easier. Also, it's a lot cheaper too. They don't have to put in drip line irrigation, do rows, do plantlings in the greenhouse. Do, there's just so many other complexities that like, yeah, if you're, a, if you're a greenhouse grower or if you're a vegetable farmer or if you're a horticultural farmer, yeah, the can cannabinoids is probably the way to go. But as you said, it's also uh, unfortunately, but it is how it occurs. I mean, CBD exploded like the dot-com boom and everybody got into it and if you're just saying I was doing CBD then everybody would come on board and like want to just throw money at it but uh, many didn't necessarily realize what it would really take to build the long-term infrastructure to build the long-term market base to really stand out in the market because if everybody's selling CBD how do you really differentiate yourself right now we're getting getting other cannabinoids and all that kind of stuff while more clinical research is needed before we can make any medical claims CBD has shown to greatly reduce inflammation which can assist with ailments such as arthritis, chronic pain, and even anxiety. However, with so many CBD brands out there, it can be hard to distinguish which brands can offer top quality products while remaining affordable. Well, thanks to today's sponsor, CBD Peer, we can bring you just that. With decades of experience in the supplement industry, CBD Peer's team is offering What Can A Radio listeners a 15% discount to their American-made, high-quality, and yet affordable products. In fact, they are so confident you will love their products that they are offering a 90-day money-back guarantee. Just use the discount code WCD at checkout or click on the link in the description to get your 15% discount. We hope you enjoy their products just as much as we do. And now back to the show. Um, but yeah, but in terms of uh, more of the focus in, like the, with the CCR, I mean, with just that unit, uh, once we can scale it up or even where it's at now, if we can build multiple of them, uh, processing the material, we can take what many uh, people consider the waste material in terms of like the CBD stocks put that into the machine and get very valuable materials on the other end that will allow us to a be a benefit to many CBD farmers because as I said it's it's often considered the waste material right I know lots of farmers that are trying to do like fire starter bundles with their their CBD stocks and trying to just get rid of the CBD stocks because it's just too much waste to try to send to a, uh, a landfill or whatever um, and so it's it's really exciting to kind of see where we're going. And then out of the CCR unit, we can get the, the paper material that we can make uh, paper products out of. And then we can use the lignin that also comes out of it to, to actually line that that if we want to make cups or water bottles or whatever. Uh, and then like with the, uh, the xylose, it's also there's uh, many benefits to it in terms of um, 
the uh, uh, many dentists have, have been looking at it in terms of potential. Uh, not, can't say it cures anything, but it can. It's it's shown to, to help with cavities. It's shown to help with uh, to, with the health of your mouth. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, from this just one plant and the waste material, we can make all these extra uh, products out of it that can really potentially compete with, with other materials, right? I mean, as you said, like the paper is really high quality. And so paper mills that are, are getting a chance to look at it are really excited about it. It's just that we aren't able to produce a high enough quantity to really make it uh, fully commercialized, right? I mean, only sending, as you said, as you've said before, sending a, a paper mill half a ton of day of material is only gonna go so far. Uh, but if we can get up to four, four tons and then eventually 10, 40, so on and so forth, um, it's just gonna be really excited to, to kind of see how that goes. Um, and so uh, for the, uh, the, the CCR to kind of develop, um, or in terms of the, the product lines that kind of come out of that, what are materials or products that you're looking at, besides even just the clamshell and the cups, that you're looking at kind of longer term uh, using those materials for? Well, if we had the, uh, the CCR was developed for ag wastes um, and wood chips. And uh, that that could still go on. So it, uh, uh, so um, you know, um, at the moment, if you after a hurricane on the east coast, if you go to the uh, uh, where the big ships are, you'll find uh, uh, most of the dead, the down branches that have been picked up in your neighborhood are now chopped up and on these ships going to, mostly to Germany, uh, where uh, they, heat, they, they are made into pellets to heat the homes. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and if you think about it, so we've got people here who are taking limbs down through a storm or, or, or cutting a line to, pre to pre prevent that from happening. Of, uh, and uh, being shipped to, to Europe, uh, three, you know, a few thousand miles and so on. Um, uh, so that though, if we put those branches in our device, we would have, we would be able to create some interesting green chemicals. So that, I guess that's my point is that, yeah. uh, that there's, uh, we could be doing a lot as opposed to shipping tree trunks <laughs> across uh, yeah <laughs> uh but uh, obviously the europeans are paying for it they a number of companies have um signed up uh in the, the southeast uh which have fast growing pine loblolly pine and other uh to make um uh pellets uh, for the european uh, marketplace so um uh, yeah. So in so if we can um, uh, solve some of the problems uh, in terms of getting, you know, more pulp. Yeah, uh, four tons and ten tons, as you mentioned, uh, of this stuff out each day, then we can really be doing some very interesting uh, things, and. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we talked about bioplastics in terms of uh, uh, replacing these mm -hmm. things, uh, bioplastics in terms of uh, um, fiberglass seats. Yeah. Now, is, isn't that, that material right there made out of the pulp? Yeah. 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 Uh, Very interesting. So, uh, I mean, there, 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 there's a lot to learn and to experiment yeah. with and, and so on. But the point is, is that if we had the quantity, then you could justify uh, yeah, doing the products. And then, uh, our, you know, we should envision a la the large scale one, 250 tons a day yeah. that might go uh, up in the Adirondacks, take yeah, all the down trees and so on, and then yeah. sell the pulp to international paper which is up there uh yeah. and uh, in a much more environmentally friendly way uh, than uh, the way it's being done today uh in terms of pulping but yeah, you know it requires uh someone like that um and that's again you know if if we uh, uh maine is very interested in uh 
because their pulp industry is disappearing. So they're interested in getting some uh, alternative rationale for keeping their mills open. But yeah. we have made, um, again, we're too small, but we have made toilet paper. We've made this paper and other pa other kinds of uh, label paper. Uh, yep. So if we had a big plant operating, we could have uh, solved the problem which happened a few weeks ago, which was a shortage in this country of toilet paper, right? And yeah. <laughs> and actually, I, I, I know on that, um, more research needs to be done to be 100% clear on it, but uh, but essentially, I mean, you kind of mentioned like the aspects of it's a lot more sustainable in terms of how we are dealing with the, the processing of the material versus like other companies are using high uh, um, chemicals that are just like uh, absolutely terrible for the environment, whereas our, our, our equipment uh, barely uses any, any chemicals other than the source material going in. Um, and so it's, uh, there's, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of benefits in terms of like, it's a lot better for the output of the environment. Uh, it's a lot better because we can use a wider variety of source materials to, to actually put into the paper process. Um, and it, yeah, as, as you mentioned, like even if, uh, even if um, we couldn't necessarily get hemp scaled up to the fullest potential or say one year uh, the hemp plants got, got taken out by some disease, uh, we can uh, pretty, pretty easily transition into uh, taking on paper from wood pulp, right? Or other materials. Well, uh, if this thing were, were really, if hemp was really successful in uh, the Northeast, you know, then uh, the um, agency that gave permission for the 6,400, 64 acre greenhouse in Oneida, they could have said, look, as part of the deal, uh, add on 10 more acres and yeah. you know, we want to have three crops of hemp a year. Uh, you know, because if we, if it makes no sense, uh, you know, just like in one year. Tomatoes, if we get yeah. some products which have some real marketplace value, uh, we either need to import from the Caribbean or we need to <laughs> put in a greenhouse here and grow three yeah. crops uh, a year. You know. So, uh, it, which is a different kind of farming than the tractor farming. But, yep. um, uh, there are people who are, are doing it. There are people who are doing it on a very small scale, uh, but you know, we, sh we should be able to accomplish that. But that's yeah. the kind of master planning uh, that, needs that needs to be done place in, uh, in the region, in New York. Uh, um, otherwise, um, the lobbyists are going to make it difficult. Yeah, absolutely. The The marijuana industry is a challenging force to, to battle against, especially since it is so wealthy at this point in time. Uh, and so, also the cotton industry against hemp. Yeah, yeah. This absolutely. is how, this is how, one of the reasons hemp died in the 30s, it wasn't only because it was a cousin of marijuana, but you had Hearst who had, uh, for his newspapers, who had uh, investments in forests to make uh, paper, yeah. and there were others who were saying, no, let's use hemp. And uh, basically, uh, he said no, uh, and so there were a number of, of reasons, but uh, that was one of them. Uh, yeah. And that, um, so the cotton industry is, in fact, a, um, a big force to be reckoned with. They're concerned about hemp, and the fact that, yeah. that, that, as I mentioned, the Denim Council has now uh, has the word hemp in their documents <laughs> for this. That's probably scaring them even more. <laughs> Yes, of course. And so we're going to find more money being spent to, this, to yep, I'm make it difficult to have a hemp mill, a mill here and so on. Yeah. So there, there are reasons why some of these things occur. And we have to do our best if we think that it's the right product for the right time and the right plant for the right time, then we need to be smart about it. Yeah. And that's where absolutely. I think a um, hemp czar <laughs> would be. Yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think that's that's definitely uh, a consideration that many maybe don't make is that we are like even though hemp has a lot of potential and it has a lot of benefits and a lot of uses and it probably even benefits over the plants that are currently being used, uh, we're still competing with other industries that are very established and have a lot of money going into it and have a lot of lobbying power and so uh, we have to figure out ways of a getting down costs or making a better product. Um, so that those those costs can kind of balance out longer term, um, because it's it is challenging to compete with such uh, um, invested interests. 
uh, and so it's yeah it's it's a, it's a fascinating thing to do um, especially since uh, if you're not growing hemp and you're not licensed to grow hemp it's illegal for you to grow hemp at least at, at the moment and so it's uh, whereas like if you're not if you're not licensed to grow cotton I don't even know if there's a cotton license but uh, it's not like it's illegal for you to put a cotton plant in the backyard and kind of start from from somewhere um, so it's it's got a, a lot of things kind of going against it but at the same time if we can really uh, show the true value and the true potential of this material then we can have a, a much stronger long-term foothold in, in, the, in all of these different industries. So it's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, and actually, uh, on the sustainability front, um, we, we got to contribute our knowledge to a published paper, uh, which was published by, uh, by RPI, um, and it's, uh, it's phenomenal to be able to, to do such things, right? To be able to share our information and knowledge base with uh, such projects and, um, and actually get this research out there because again it's, it's uh, about we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel if we can share knowledge uh, at least to the point where uh, we can really like start up an industry um, then I think we'll be a lot further along uh, because I was talking with Jen, Jen Jenkins from Morrisville and one of the things she was mentioning is that most every other industry um, at least on some level shares a whole bunch of information whether it's on the uh, agricultural side of things or it's on the manufacturing processing side of things obviously there's the ip that people don't want to share because they want to have uh, an edge in the marketplace but um there it, there's less of constantly reinventing the wheel 100 percent. whereas that seems to be somewhat the case in the hemp industry even though we also have this like community behind it right um it's it's a uh, it's interesting to kind of see how that develops and so um in terms of the to kind of break down the fashion fibers a bit more uh, obviously, like all these denim companies talking about using hemp is just amazing. Um, what is your opinion on it being something that kind of can help jumpstart the manufacturing in the United States again? Because as we see, uh, if we're just basing our economy purely mostly on service, retail, and uh, tourism, then something like COVID hitting is going to uh, uh, knock us down a few pegs. Um, so we really need to bring bring back uh, making physical goods to, to at least to some extent. Yeah, well, I mentioned that there there are uh, uh, centers of excellence around the world with hemp. Uh, some are the medicinal, some are the fiber, uh, some are the grain. Um, and, um, you know, in the 1980s, the USDA burnt all of the seeds, all of the, all of the American. Oh. It's painful to think about. <laughs> so the world's largest hemp seed bank now is in Russia. Um, so it, it probably pays somebody from Cornell to go over there uh, to take a look at that. Seeds. That would be a task that I would suggest is worthwhile Absolutely. doing if they let them in. Uh, the, the next thing is to identify the hemp fiber centers around the world. So obviously China is one of them, but there are uh, uh, Poland, Romania, um, Pakistan, um, uh, Vietnam, and Mexico are other places that are are building up to, to help these denim companies. Um, so are they all importing hemp mills from China? Are they buying new ones from uh, Amsterdam? I, I don't have an answer for that, yeah. but that would be a project that um, would be worth uh, uh, doing. Um, and then structuring a deal just like we do um, you know, there's an island off of Manhattan called Roosevelt Island. I'm familiar with the island, yes. International competition, which was the, uh, an American and foreign university had to join arms to present that they would create a world-class research center. Gotcha. Who won? <laughs> it was uh, uh, Israel and Cornell. <laughs> so they have if you go down there now you find that the island is totally been rebuilt uh, multi-billion yep. dollar facility research facilities um, so uh, it's not uh, out of the question that the United States invites foreign skill sets yep. when it's appropriate so in some cases it might be medicine in other cases it could be this one because we've lost it we, we, we yep. 
we burnt it ourselves. <laughs> Nobody bombed us. We did it all to ourselves. <laughs> Uh, Shot herself so, in the foot, very literally. Well, I think that, you know, again, I think there are two things here. One is, uh, and I know that uh, Dan at RPI has been working on a decorticator, uh, so that there are people who are thinking about uh, using, you know, jumping over, not just copying what China is doing and so on, but, but advancing it further. Uh, and uh, but uh, what I was mentioning earlier about the ventilators that if word got out that there was a prize, the first prize and the second prize, uh, so it didn't uh, so that there were you know bright creative people who knew uh, in Pakistan or wherever who came up with an inexpensive uh, but highly reliable uh, decorticator and mill, uh, we'd have it. We'd have one in yeah. New York, you know, uh, and um, to me, that's such a basic thing that we need to start tomorrow morning on. So that when the seeds are ready, we've got a mill here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We can actually process them and, and uh, pay the farmers. Otherwise, we're do. twiddling our thumbs and we're, yep. we're pointing to Cornell saying, great job. And then we're all the growers are frustrated <laughs> that, they, yeah. that they don't have a marketplace. Thank you very much for joining us here on What Can I Radio, where we bring a dose of reality to your conversations about hemp every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. If you enjoyed what you heard, please smash that like button below for our YouTube overlords. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our channel so you can be the first to know the secrets we reveal. If you need another dose of reality right this moment, check out the video up here. Or if you want to see what YouTube has to offer you, check out the videos over here or down below. Thank you very much for joining us and have a mind-expanding day.